you go into a bookstore and you head straight for the uh, self-help shelf, of which there's millions of books. And if any of those books did any good, why are there so many of them? You know, and if you then turn to social work or psychology or nursing or medicine, fairly small set of books because that stuff works because that's seeking happiness and joy by paying attention to others. And this is what gets better with time and is enormously useful to the community. Now, what comes after care is keeper of the meaning. Instead of trying to raise adolescents and young adults, as we do as teachers, as we do as baseball managers, what about making sure that there's justice? And this is the difference between keeper of the meaning and generativity. And often, keeper of the meaning seems rather stuffy. I mean, an exciting litigator lawyer for the underserved is thrilling. And that old fart that sits up there on the bench, uh, you know, what's he do for a living? But the point is, is that you can have care without justice, but you can't have justice without care. So we have young people like Henry Ford inventing the automobile and destroying rural America forever, and Charles Lindbergh pioneering the major airlines international air route destroying indigenous societies forever. And then when they got to be 60 to 70, Henry Ford spent his life trying to put together a museum to recreate New England before Ford. And Lindbergh spent his last years spending his life trying to protect uh, indigenous communities from invasion by the world. And then finally comes integrity, which is the last of life's great tasks. And in Erickson's words, it's to try to convey some world order and spiritual sense. No matter how dearly paid for, it's the acceptance of one's one and only life cycle as something that had to be, and by necessity, permits no substitution. And to give you a sense of how this is, there is an absolutely beautiful wave off of Hawaii's North Shore, a surfer's dream. And we'll call it Paris Hilton or Donald Trump. And it's the best surfer's wave that ever was. And it, as it comes closer and closer to the shore, I'm going to hit the shore and be destroyed. The most beautiful wave in the world will be lost. And in the background comes a little elderly grandmother wave. And she says to Paris, don't worry, honey. You're not going to die like a wave. You're going to live forever as part of the ocean. OK, so let me give you a concrete example in the form of Adam Mann. He was someone who was such a perfect teenager. In other words, not dealing properly with uh, identity. That his mother said, I only had to ask Adam to do something. And he always did it as if he were delighted. Now, Unbeknownst to both his mother and his father, Adam, who they described as a perfect youngster, did acquire a motorcycle. He did learn to dance well enough, so he thought maybe he wouldn't go into medicine like his dad, but uh, become an Arthur Murray 
dance instructor. And he had a number of exciting affairs, which in 1940 for Harvard boys was uh, unusually mature. <laughs> but that soon ended. He got married to a conventional 26-year-old uh, wife, and for a while they lived very happily in kind of brotherly, sisterly uh, intimacy. And he did exactly what his father said. His father had one of those wonderful Los Angeles medical practices where you were doctor to the stars, had close relationships with the uh, rich and famous, and got wonderful pleasure out of private practice. But he told his son that the future of medicine was in research and that he should become a researcher, which Adam obediently did. He went to Harvard College. He went to Harvard Medical School. He went to the Mass General. He became chief resident. He went on to Rockefeller Institute and did basic research in DNA six years before Watson and Crick. Okay. So he dealt with intimacy, and he, uh, true, the um, interviewer um, said of him, um, not a very broad dimensioned person in my mind. That was the internist. The um, social interviewer said, uh, he's a or, I'm sorry, it's TAT, a superficial guy, passive kind of dependence on circumstance, unsureness about his own fate, passively awaiting it. There's a constant rejection of women and their sexual charms, seeking out the socially acceptable to avoid private emotion. So here's a guy that at uh, 18 was a very exciting member of the grant study and understood romance. And during his locked-in 20s as a white-suited resident, didn't have the foggiest idea of what uh, passion was about. And his career went fine. He said he loved research more than private practice, and he won the prizes for passing not only intimacy, which is living in a reciprocal interdependent relationship with another person for at least 10 years. Now, people say, why do you say 10 years? Shouldn't intimacy be forever? And here I have to share with you something that I just discovered in the last uh, year, because working on a longitudinal study means you get to play in the sandbox forever and keep finding new things. And what I found to my horror was that pe between the ages of 70 and 90, the marriages, the second, or in one case, fifth marriages, of people who were divorced were just as good as the people whose marriages were always happy. In contrast, the people whose marriages were unhappy at 45, had marriages that were still unhappy from 70 to 80. Or put in a little bit more outrageous terms, and newspaper interviewer asked Margaret Mead, um, tell me, uh, Dr. Mead, uh, about your three unsuccessful marriages. And Margaret Mead fixed her with her eyes and said, en contraire. I have had three successful marriages, one for each stage of my life. <laughs> well, that's probably cuter than it's uh, entirely true, but um, it's informational. In any case, uh, Dr. Mann became a, we'll let it be Harvard, a professor of medicine at Harvard. Uh, he published a few papers. He was contented with his life. He was well compensated. Uh, and he was theoretically happily married. At least that's what he said at 30. If 
you think of when you consolidate your career as kind of a second licensing. But he was so depressed that he was thinking of suicide. Only he was so emotionally inhibited that he referred to his depression as fatigue the way an adolescent does rather than giving it affective um, context. Okay, there is all I knew about him when at 47 I went to interview him in his private office looking out over the Charles and here was this suave internist with his uh, pearl tipped, uh, I mean ivory tipped stethoscope uh, just charming the pants off me telling me about his exciting romantic uh, relationships and saying, you know, when he was doing research, he used to say, I'm like my father, but he betters me in every respect. He now said to me, when he was doing what his father did, rather than trying to do what his father said, uh, this is of me and by me, uh, it's more of a natural talent. And I mean, there's no question that to my narrow latency 33-year-old uh, eyes, this guy rocked. <laughs> so what do you do next? Now, all the time he was telling me that he was beloved by his patients, and he was a good dad and a loyal member of the vestry. And as he was showing care, he still lived within a fairly small circle. While this interview was going on, the Vietnam War was raging, the struggle for civil rights was raging, and he was oblivious of it. So at 65, went back to see him, and he had gone back into academic medicine to be the uh, chairman of the hospital. In other words, instead of caring for patients, he was wiping the noses of narcissistic doctors and omnipotent uh, nursing supervisors, <laughs> trying to get the place to uh, run. So his social radius had widened and included much more community. At the same time, he had become, was beginning to become interested in medical ethics. And what he was teaching at the bedside was history taking and bedside manners. And as we move into, from keeper of the meaning to integrity, he retired from his job as running the hospital, threw himself totally into medical ethics, and instead of being, as a young man, forging the uh, molecular genetic revolution, he spent his time as an internationally known medical ethicist.